Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Each week, EWTN gives me this great privilege of introducing to you men and women who, guided by the Holy Spirit, uh, sometimes nudged by circumstance, uh, a variety of ways that God uses to get their attention, yet He helped them by grace to come home to a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ and particularly a deeper relationship in the church, in the body of Christ being a part of the family of God. And so that's what our program's about. And uh, now we're in our 14th season, so welcome to the program. Our guest tonight is Doug Lascelles. Uh, some of you, especially in Ohio, who are viewing this program are going to recognize him. Uh, it's a pleasure to have him on the program because I recognize him from his work in local television and sports. And we'll um, certainly talk about that in a moment. But uh, it's a, wel a great pleasure to welcome you, Doug, to the program. It's great to be here, Marcus. Thank, Thank you. you very much. It's good to see you. We we bumped into each other. Absolutely. Had the pleasure of introducing you at the Catholic Men's Conference a few years ago. That's right. Yeah. Which, uh, those of you, again, in Ohio, uh, the Men's Conference has been growing every year, hasn't yeah, it? it? It certainly has. We had a record attendance last year in both the men and women, now at the Lausche Building at the Ohio State Fairgrounds. So it's it's going gangbuster. That's great. And I think was it this last year or the year before that one of the reasons it was such a great attendance is that the Crossing the Goal uh, team were the actual speakers. Right? Two years ago, yep. Danny Abramowitz and Peter Herbick and, and it, I, I think they're spot on in terms of you want to reach the Catholic man. Football is a good place to start and these guys uh, just they talk about uh, you know Danny Abramowitz's book Spiritual Workout for a Former Saint, Former right. New Orleans right. Saint and they just have some some great messages, and I encourage everybody to check that out on EWTN as well, Crossing the Goal. Well, maybe, great program. We'll, maybe later in the, in the program we might get into a discussion about uh, uh, the relationships between the faith life and, and the sporting world, because mm -hmm. I'm one that really believes that, especially a sport like football, you know, that there's more to it than purely the game, that there's a lot of uh, character building, teamwork, a lot we can learn about our our imperfections and the way we get along with one another when we have to work together on a team like football or any sports, there's value to it. Absolutely. So, um, but it can also be become the center of people's lives, and, and uh, in that process, they forget about the the true point of life, which is our relationship with our Lord. But let me quit talking and get out of the way <laughs> and invite you, as I do every week, uh, to start from the beginning and give the audience where'd you come from spiritually? Well, I grew up in. Edison, New Jersey, Marcus. Uh, my parents, wonderful parents, taught us all the right lessons, be good to others, do the right thing, moral, uh, ethical type values, but not a faith-based uh, upbringing. My mom was a cradle Catholic from Boston who, as my dad later told me after my mom passed, questioned the uh, Catholic doctrine when she was at a Catholic college. She went to Regis College, a small right. liberal arts school outside right. Boston. She went to Catholic grade school and high school and college and, and evidently had some questions about her faith and from what my dad explained was told at that time by the priests that you know that's just what we teach just buy into it and she kind of felt like it was a blind faith and so she she fell away from the church and, and unfortunately it was at a time where she met my dad who was second generation agnostic came over from England and, and my two brothers and I I think we were pretty much headed to third generation agnostics uh, in, in our family growing up. But you know, it's funny, I, I spoke at a Catholic men's luncheon a couple of months ago in Columbus and, and I started thinking, I mean, I have vivid recollections, Marcus, growing up as a child. We went to a Unitarian church. My dad's thought oh, okay. was, we're going to expose our children to religion. And we discussed at the Unitarian Fellowship uh, Judaism, Catholicism, Protestant faiths, and you were sort of left to determine what you yeah. believed. Well, that is not anything I think a 10, 11 year old child is capable of, of maybe, some are, maybe I wasn't smart enough of assimilating that and figuring out what your faith is. So, um, and then at age 13, my dad thought, well, you know, I've exposed my kids mm -hmm. to, to religion. It's up to them to decide whether they want to continue to go to church. And our Unitarian Fellowship was probably 40 minutes away and we just sort of stopped going and you know, 10-year-old kid, it was more time for me to go out and play football, you know, or <laughs> 13-year-old yeah. kid. So <clears throat> I, I really didn't have any direction in my faith. But you know, it's funny, about that time, 
as I think some young children may have a, a tendency to, to think about, I remember thinking about, well, what happens when I pass away? What, what, where do I go? What, what do, do I, is, is there a heaven? Is there a hell? I remember having a numb feeling as a 10 and 11 year old that when I pass from this earth, is that it? And without any real formal um, church life as a, as a child, around that time, I just started praying to God. And I, I wasn't directed to, my parents didn't really encourage it, but I, I would just get on my knees, simple prayers, asking for the well-being of my family and, and for those less fortunate. And, and, um, and it, it just, it sort of started with that. And then I went off to college and I got into my broadcasting career and fast forward to uh, 1990. And I'm 33 years old. I'm a sportscaster at the NBC affiliate in Columbus, and, and I feel like I'm, I'm living my life in a, in a good way. I'm, I'm volunteering for charities. I'm helping the less fortunate, but I'm not living a life of faith. And, and at that time, a former OSU football player by the name of Calvin well, Murray. I'm going to pause you there. I'm going to pause yeah. you there because uh, you know, that's a, a really good event in your life, I think, when that happens. But I'm going to pause you and back up sure. just a little bit. Because uh, your experience growing up in that Unitarian environment, which is interesting because Unitarianism, even when it, when it began, its purpose was not to say it doesn't matter what you believe, they're all equal. But that's kind of the message you were getting, right? I felt in, so. In a way. I mean, yeah. it, uh, sure. In, an, in a uh, maybe unintentional way, but by saying there's this faith, this faith, this faith, you choose for yourself in the end. Why choose any of them, mm -hmm. or it doesn't matter. You, it's interesting you came out of that at least though with a, with an underlying conviction that there must be a God. Right. That's what you're kind of telling us, right? At least out of that childhood, somehow in there, the grace of God who, cr who created you in the image of His Son, that seed planted there, did sprout a little bit, right? Yeah, absolutely. You were literally at times consciously turning to God. Mm -hmm. All right, so you have that as your background. You jumped way ahead. Was there an influence at all in college in that? Or was, did it continue to drop out of the way, just not important compared to everything else in life? And again, because I don't think I had the solid foundation, Marcus, right. it did drop away. I mean, other priorities, getting your education. Uh, for me, I was driven to become a sportscaster, which is a very competitive business. I mean, the thought of going to, to church on a Sunday while I was in college, didn't cross my mind. And, so really and, your assumption was, and, and this is what I want to connect, because I know there are men watching here, we get caught up in this, is that if you were to take a step back from yourself and look at what you did in college, the choices you were making, the accomplishments, this was you. Yeah, yeah. This, but is, it, what, this is what you accomplished. That's how you would have saw that it wasn't God blessing you, or it wasn't it was exactly. all of His grace. Yeah. It was what you were did, and if you were going to accomplish anything, it was up to you to it, do it. It was my will, not God's will. Uh, absolutely. And at the time, of course, I didn't realize it. And again, while I was exposed to the Unitarian Church, and I later did a little research, and Unitarian is basically one God as yeah. opposed to yeah. the Trinity, and I realized, again, without the parental sort of influence and the direction and the nurturing, it, it was, I think, naive to think that I'm going to come out with right. any sense of who God is, what my role yeah. in life is. I mean, I've learned so much since coming to the church about what I didn't know then. Yeah. It, it, it's like they say, my dad's favorite quote, youth is wasted uh, on the young. And you think back, gosh, <laughs> had I been exposed to it when I was young to, Maybe. to it, know. I think a lot of our viewers, either themselves or seen around them, that this was a time period when a lot of parents felt that way, you know, that maybe it's not my responsibility to, to, to uh, impose a faith on my children. Yeah, that would, that would characterize, I'm sure, my, my parents' thought process. And maybe a lot of men today, even now, as they're adults, wonder whether I should or shouldn't because of the way they were handed it. And, and I can say as a parent of two children, I absolutely believe now, having experienced it, that no, they, the kids need that direction. I mean, you know, yeah. they, they need to learn how to color inside the lines and how to write and how to do math. Why wouldn't you spend the time to help them understand what they need to do from a, from a faith perspective, spend at least as much time on that? And I, and I think just in general, yeah. we leave too much of that to chance. And, and you know, now I know that, yeah. and I've had this conversation with my dad. I mean, I don't begrudge the way he brought us up, but in hindsight, uh, 
yeah, I think you need that direction to know what, 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 and you, you said it best, Marcus, my will, not God's will. At the time, I thought my will wasn't yeah. in perhaps um, not in concert with God's will. But when you look back at it, of course, uh, if yeah. you're concentrating on your will and not God's will, well, that's not the way where God created us. I mean, us. by the grace of God, he, he still may have been leading you and making sure that, but, I mean, when you think about it, uh, just as you're saying, if we're not helping our children early on, at least have as a part of the equation of their life that we've got to ask what will be right in the eyes of God, we're not preparing them for the time they're making decisions oh, yeah. in college, all the decisions you were going to make in college, what career, my life, marriage, all those issues. Well, I, and, and I would say I feel even much more stronger than that, not, not at least directing. It's the most important direction. The, the educational process is important. The social process is important. All of that flows from helping our children understand this is our faith, this is God's will. And now that I have the opportunity to experience that with our, yeah. our five-year-old little girl, you realize, gosh, life is so much easier if you come at it from that perspective. Yeah. A lot of the other issues, and, and as we develop my story, I'll, I'll right. admit that there were directions I went in that right. in hindsight were not the direction God wanted me to go in because God was not a, a, a real uh, factor or, or direction in my life. Well, as I'm hearing your story, I'm also hearing the formation of a conscience, right? You think I would say it. that, sure, absolutely. And there's good and bad in that. And right. sometimes consciences aren't formed. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the conscience gets full of baggage and sometimes good and bad. It's our conscience, how we're going to make decisions. So even when we have an awakening to faith, our conscience isn't always sudden, cleared, clean, and now I'm starting fresh again. We've got stuff to work through. So, okay, well, we're fasting forward into the 90s. Right. And uh, you're doing sport broadcasting locally? Yep, at, at Channel 4 in Columbus. And, and again, I think I'm leading my life in a, in a, a way where I'm considerate of others. I'm spending a lot of times. I, I worked with uh, Jimmy Crum, who is one of the oh, great... Right humanitarians yeah, yeah, in the history yeah, of broadcasting. Oh, just, of course, I watched you too. But I well, thank you. But I, Jimmy, I 40 too. years at Channel 4 and just did so many things with, everybody knows what he did with Recreation Unlimited and the Easter Seals. When he retired, I went back and looked and figured out he was involved in raising about $21 million for charity in his 40 years at Channel 4. And what a lot of people wow. didn't know is on his dinner break, like Woody Hayes, he'd be over at Children's Hospital visiting kids. I mean, I tell people that Jimmy taught me a, a thing or two about broadcasting, but he taught me a lot more about being a, a, a great human being. Was so, he a man of faith? He, he was. Um, but, and it's interesting because I came to the Catholic Church after Jimmy had retired. And we talked a little bit about our faith, but not a lot. Okay. And, and I kind of regret that, Marcus. I wish yeah. I had spent more yeah. time talking to him about that. But I know he was buried in a, in a Presbyterian service. And, okay. and, and Jim absolutely was a man of faith. I, like me... I don't know early in my life that it was a huge, you know, part of his life. Um, I, I, I just don't know, okay. but right. but I, I have to figure based on the wonderful did, things uh, yeah. that Jimmy did that absolutely yeah. it, it was it was based on. So he was an influence on you then. Just, oh, absolutely. Just, just bumping yep. elbows J with J him. What yeah, just seeing what Jimmy would do. I mean, he worked tirelessly for the people less fortunate, and so so again, I was doing all those things. But you can do all those things and still not be doing what God wants you to do in every area of your life. Sure. And, and in 1990, as I mentioned, uh, a former OSU football player, Calvin Murray, great guy who I just got to know through mutual yeah. friends, gave me my first Bible. Well, you know, how much is your faith being directed by God if at age 30 is the first time you're actually looking in the Bible? <laughs> so that was kind of an awakening wow. for me. Well, um, and then I, I started dating a, a gal who uh, we were going to a, a Christian church. I had, you know, quote, come to Jesus. Um, and but we obviously weren't acting in the way that Jesus would would want our lives to go. We had a, a baby out of wedlock. Now, thankfully, because we're Christians, the, th the thought of not having a child never entered our mind, and, and we welcomed a, a beautiful baby boy, Nicholas, into the world in 1990. And, and uh, I struggled with whether I should marry my son's mom. And it was actually our, our pastor who said, "Don't marry because you have a child. Marry because you love each other." Mm -hmm. And, and I struggled with that, and we, we made the decision not to marry, and she married, I later married, and our, our son we, uh, we brought up, and, and I was a dad in every sense of the word. And, but that was a, a seminal moment for me, Marcus, because I, I realized, gosh, I'm not 
living by God's will. I was wondering that because you, oh. I mean, here real quickly, with almost within a year, you get a Bible, and faith, right? Become active in a church, and then of course you have a child, right? And all that's within a, about a year. That's that's fast. Absolutely, and and and, and I realize I am not leading the life that God wants me to lead. And it's interesting, and, and as we develop, as I later yeah. find out, my conversion to the Catholic Church, that it's more than just faith. There, there are a set of rules, a set of rules that Jesus Christ wants us to follow for our well-being. And oh, by the way, premarital sex is one of the, it's a violation of a rule. And, and, and that rule is there for a good reason. And, and I, I came to learn that in hindsight, but I, I, I knew that, that I wasn't living the life that God wanted me to lead. Often it's described as, uh, uh, you know, that the, the long distance between head and heart. Mm -hmm. We could also describe it as a long distance between head and conscience. Right. Right. I mean, so you were accepting your faith in Christ, probably maybe even in, a, in an evangelical context, you may actually have done that publicly, right? Oh, yeah. Sure. You know, they accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, and so it's in your head, mm -hmm. a conviction... It's starting to seep in a little bit, but you've got a 30-year conscience right. that hasn't had the influence of God. Right? I mean, that's, yeah. well, that's I, part of the, I mean, we're not looking for excuses for the mistake you made. That's not the point. Right. But you're affirming the need to grow it takes a, a period of time. And again, I, and it's interesting, you, you could be my psychotherapist as I think about this, <laughs> I, if I had one, where you go back and you think about the influences without that, that foundation from a youth I'm big on sports analogies being yeah. a former sportscaster I drive my wife crazy Marcus but I mean think about a you know you can say I'm a professional football player because I got drafted by by a team but if you're not running the right pass routes if you're not coming to to the meetings on time if you're not putting in the effort you are a football player in name only I mean you're not going to be a professional football player very long in in the corporate world there are rules and regulations and parameters. Well, when you think about it, both of those are good examples, but they take a back seat to our faith. And yet, if you have a faith, but it's not directed by some parameters and some rules and some regulations, which once you start to understand the faith are there, as I mentioned, for a very good reason, yeah. then I'm a Christian in name only. I'm not, I'm not leading a Christian life. And, and I knew it then. Yeah. And, and it, it gave me pause for thought. And I, and I certainly... Um, got more active in the church, and, and quite honestly, the, the biggest single blessing in my life then followed that I met a lady uh, about a year later who, um, uh, cradle Catholic, uh, she's from Puerto Rico, her, her mom is uh, an exile from Cuba, um, who just wonderful gal who, again, did not wear her uh, Catholic faith on her sleeve, but was not at all... Um, unwilling to share her faith. I think she just kind of felt like, you know, let's feel this out. And, um, I, you know, I, I joke that she, she stalked me. And in fact, I, I, I would take no, I wouldn't take no for an answer with my, my then girlfriend, then fiance and now wife. And, and I knew I, I fell head over heels in love with her, Marie and Infante. And she brought me to the Catholic church. And, and what I came to realize and understand through dating her was, Wow, this is as I mentioned before. This is the structure. This is the the these are the boundaries. This is the 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 box in which the faith makes sense. And and I think once you understand what the parameters are, it makes it a lot easier for you to to follow the faith. And and so that's where I um, I went through our our CIA in 1994 and and uh, became a Catholic um, Easter. Uh, weekend of 1994. My wife and I were married three months later. And, and I, uh, as we all know, your walk is, is a lifelong journey, Marcus. <laughs> I think I've, I've learned so much more since then. We're, in fact, doing right now a, a catechism study with Father Carapi. Oh, and, sure. uh, and, and I was actually yeah, convicted yeah, yeah. at the Catholic Men's Conference last year where Patrick Madrid said, you know, the reality is m most Catholics or many Catholics, we don't know enough about our faith. Yeah. We're, we're ignorant about our faith. So, so as I learn more, uh, it, it just strengthens my resolve to become the best man, the best Catholic, the best Catholic man I can be. Well, let me ask you then on, uh, on 
uh, just on a, let's say, a doctrinal issue, uh, for a lot of who come from very staunch evangelical backgrounds, when they come into the Catholic Church, there are doctrinal issues, there's a lot of things that stand in the way. It, yours is a little bit different because you went from Unitarianism, mm -hmm. if you want to call it that, I mean, right. that was just the environment you had, to, it sounds like a very brief evangelical period, Yes. Right? Into Catholicism. Were there any doctrinal, did you have to deal with the doctrinal barriers coming into the Catholic Church at well, all? Well, you? you know, it's interesting. I, I felt that I did not because I heard on um, Catholic Answers, as a matter of fact, on St. Gabriel Catholic Radio in Columbus, I thought it, it was explained so well when someone talked about, someone called in and was asking about, well, what do I say to my non-denominational evangelical Christian friends who question our faith, you know, who's right, who's wrong, and, and that's a question we all hear. And, yep. and the host put it in such great terms when he said, you know, obviously we're, we're, we're not to criticize another Christian faith, but from our perspective, it's the wholeness of the faith. It's if you believe that the Eucharist is the body and blood of Christ, it, that it is the church that was founded by Jesus Christ, it, it actually exposes you to the fullness of the, the relationship with Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ wanted his followers to have. So from that regard, Marcus, it was actually easier for me because what I realized was in terms of the, the, the perhaps differences in doctrine and, and belief was predicated on, a, on ignorance. I, I didn't know what the basis for my faith was, and for me, Catholicism was was wonderful because it, it gave me that basis. Again, how, how could I have been a quote evangelical Christian and have a baby out of wedlock? Well, because I wasn't living the faith. I, I didn't know what the what the, the 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 parameters and the rules were. And and again, I, I just think that you know to call yourself anything without understanding what defined you as that thing is, in hindsight, yeah. naive on my yeah. part. So, the the. I had few issues, and it was, again, a blessing to have been directed to the Catholic Church from my wife and her mom. Her mom goes to Mass every day, prays every day. Uh, you know, for me to learn more about the Catholic faith made it easier for me to embrace it and, and realize that any of the, the differences or the, the, the doctrinal issues were, were not issues at all for me. And it, it was the Catholic Church was the basis for me to okay, I know that I've always had it in my heart that there's a God. Well, now I know that, you know, what God's trying to direct in my life, that Jesus is his son, he died for my sins, this is what we need to do to, to please uh, Jesus. It, 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 quite frankly, was only a couple of years ago where the, the purpose of life, and it was so well described in a Catholic men's group meeting, was to know, love, and serve God. Well, I felt like I knew God for 20 years before I came to that conclusion, Marcus. <laughs> How do you see now that you have a message, and I, and I know that you do, how do you see that the life God in His uh, uh, sometimes undiscernible wisdom led you through all those years? How has that prepared your present message? In what ways has that prepared your present message that you have for people, when you, whether it's a men's conference or doing the, the, the radio program for Catholic sports in our, in our local area? How has your life helped your present message? That's a great question, and, and I would say it, it's helped me direct people. Don't waste a lot of time not going to the source of the answers. Mm -hmm. don't, don't just let years go by while you try to define who you are and, and what God's will is. I mean, if you believe in your heart that my purpose on life is to know, love, and serve God, and I believe that the Catholic Church was founded by Jesus Christ, it makes it pretty simple for me to head in that direction. I mentioned this, this uh, talk that I gave to the uh, Catholic Men's Ministry luncheon in Columbus. I was asked to do it, and mm -hmm. I'd never really, you know, typically as an MC or as a host, I'm on your side of the table. So I, right. <laughs> I'd never really been asked. It's easier to be on our Yeah, <laughs> exactly, to, to, to give my story. And I started thinking about that, and, and I think this sort of answers your question. And I thought, you know, if you're, and again, big into analogies, a professional athlete, how did that person become a professional athlete? Well, they started playing Pop Warner football or Little League baseball when they were five, and then they got into 
travel baseball, and then if they were good enough, they played in high school, and then they were drafted, and they played A ball and double A AA and triple A, and at the age of 24, they, if they're, they're good enough and they're blessed enough, they go to Major League Baseball after spending 18 years hitting, throwing, running, and, and, and playing that game. Well, a business CEO, same type of deal, typically has a, a bachelor's and a master's and 20 years experience in, in dealing with these issues. And, and I, I, I tell people that it's kind of like the baseball player, you develop during that time what's called muscle memory, where it's a well-known concept that after swinging at a baseball, that literally thousands of times through your youth, your muscles are trained to swing that bat in the most effective way to meet the ball. And I to think do of it, something that science says is impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah a <laughs> round a c- a cylinder meeting a round ball, exactly. <laughs> and and then in the corporate world, maybe it's mind memory where you've done all these wonderful, uh, had all these experiences over 20 years in an education. Well, I like to think of it as moral memory that you get through the time that you put into the faith. And w- w- my message probably would be, Marcus, if you ha- are going to exert the effort and have the discipline to do that to become a great athlete or a great business person, wouldn't it follow that in order to become the best possible Catholic and the best possible man, son, brother, uh, husband that I can be, I need to put in the discipline to do that. And, and again, it's, it's not uh, rocket science, it's, it's getting into the Word, it's attending a men's uh, weekly um, uh, men's group, which I've had, I've been blessed to attend in Columbus with, with men who can be accountability partners. It's it's and, and it's for for kids, for women, whatever that that organization is that help get you, gets you closer to God. It's attending mass daily or weekly. So the message is, don't waste a lot of time figuring out yeah. what the the uh, structure is. Go to your Catholic church. Go to mass. Get involved in activities that will help you find the answers right away. And, and I, I, I kind of wish I had that in my youth. Well, you know, just to, to bring the analogy, even just within the church, that's why, for example, within the Catholic Church, for a man to become a priest, you don't just all of a sudden have a conversion to Jesus Christ on Friday and then, and then within a year you're, you're leading a congregation, right. which sadly outside the Catholic Church happens all the time. When men have awakenings and they're in a particular denomination, that because he happens to be a good speaker or a charismatic personality, well, he's risen to the top and there he is leading people, when his, his faith is almost tofu. I mean, in ter- there's no depth of it, whereas the church has always emphasized that it's a long process, not just to become a priest but to, or to become a bishop, but for every one of us to live out our faith. It's a day-by-day, long-term growth. Sometimes, like you, we go through rough times, but then your, your example of, of your child is that very quickly you're a Christian, but you were not spiritually prepared still to make the right decisions in the midst of the spiritual battle. C.S. Lewis in his wonderful book, Screw Tape Letters, in that where the demons are, are trying to keep a guy from becoming a Christian. Well, immediately they fail, he becomes a Christian, and the demons are figuring out, okay, now what do we do? Well, they want to make him fall immediately. Yeah. Well, soon someone declares they're a Christian. The temptations are going to come. Mm-hmm. Well, were you prepared for that? Let's talk. We're, we're going to take a break now, okay. but let's dig more into some of these issues. I also want to find out more about, you, excuse me, your work with the men. Absolutely. Here in Columbus. So okay. Back in a bit. Welcome back to The Journey Home. Our guest tonight is Douglas Sells. He's uh, no longer uh, on the, the regular networks here in town, right? Uh, about, you, but about eight years ago, my wife said, could you possibly do something for a living where we might see you once in a while? <laughs> so I, I got out of full-time sports casting, nights, weekends, holidays, and got into advertising and PR and doing some entrepreneurial things. But 
I uh, have had the opportunity to stay involved with the Catholic uh, High School Football Preview Show on St. Gabriel Radio. And so, no, not full-time broadcasting, much to the delight of my wife. Um, well, there's so much we can talk about. Um, I love sports, too. And talk a bit about that in relationship to the faith. Uh, do you see that um, the whole, I mean, the sporting world is what you'd want to call it, right? I mean, it's amazing. Oh, yeah. Um, in fact, sometimes when you, you look into the stands uh, of uh, any professional football game, you see people that have gone a little bit overboard uh, in, in the, their fanaticism in sporting world. But talk about the relationship to the sporting world, the sporting phenomenon, and the faith. Well, I think like anything, if you have if sports is a false god, it's a bad thing. If it's a diversion and a fun thing and an activity, it's a good thing. And sports, you know, from my perspective as a sportscaster, Marcus, my, I mean, my favorite sport to cover, high school football. I mean, it's <laughs> at, it's at its essence, it's it's uh, innocence, it's youth going out and enjoying the fun of the game. And to take that to the next level through my work with the Catholic High School Football Preview Show on St. Gabriel Radio, which we do every Friday at 6 o'clock, and we do the Catholic High School Game of the Week. Um, the seven area Central Ohio Catholic schools, well, DeSales and Bishop Watterson and Hartley, will cover their games. I've had the opportunity to talk to some coaches. I mean, Bill Franks is a great example. This guy, where sports and faith intersect, Bill Franks is the head coach at Newark Catholic. Okay. He played, and I'm old enough to remember Bill when he played for Newark Catholic back in the mid-'80s. They won three state championships in his time at high school, which is just amazing. If you win one, yeah, yeah. you're blessed, and they won three I of remember them. those days when he right. was a powerhouse. Oh, yeah, they, they, yeah. they won. Yeah. Newark Catholic has won overall seven state titles, but three of them while Bill Franks was there. He went off to the University of Dayton Catholic College and played football there, and he got into coaching. And he ascended rapidly. He's a smart guy, knows the game. And he, as a young head coach, was at Newark High School. And they had just won a league championship. And he was on the cusp of, of professionally, you know, really uh, moving up the ladder. He took a pay cut to go to Newark Catholic because he knows the value of a Catholic education and how important it is. And, you know, I've said this many times. One of my favorite quotes, Billy Graham, the Reverend Billy Graham said, a a youth coach can have more influence on a kid in a season than a pastor or a priest or a rabbi might have in an entire childhood. Think about that. I mean, yeah. good and bad. So to have a guy like Bill Franks as your coach, to me, is uh, such a great thing because he's not just talking X's and O's. He's talking about the development of character, talking about his faith. My son um, played hockey for DeSales, and to hear the, you know, the, the messages that the, the coaches are able to deliver in a Catholic school where you don't have to worry about praying before a game and you don't have to, mm -hmm. to worry about you know, the, the faith-based messages. I just think that, and you and I touched on it briefly in the first segment, like many experiences in our youth, sports is such a great teacher. I mean, the, 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 yeah. the value of working hard and sacrifice and, and, and handling adversity. And all those are, are life lessons that you need in your faith, in your professional life, in whatever, you know, your, your personal life. So it, it's, um, and it's a great vehicle. I, I think sports is a great vehicle to be able to share your faith. Yeah, one, one of the things that I always like, especially football is one of my favorite as well as basketball. But um, and it's the sportcasters that kind of do this a little bit. In other words, we'll hear about the quarterback or the great running back, the Heisman Trophy, right? And they're the ones that get all the airtime mm -hmm. and how great they are. But the beauty of football is that if it wasn't for that tackle or the center, right. that quarterback wouldn't be anything. The beauty of that is it recognizes that every one of us has unique gifts and a place to play in the great work that we have together as a church. I mean, that's, it's not just the bishop. It's not just the priest. It's every one of us. Right. And, and in a way, we're kind of moving into the issue also of the men's work because in some ways that's one of the main things we can use sports to get the men to realize that every single one of them is an image of Jesus Christ and has that place to play in the church, in their community, in their family. Right. Well, we talked briefly uh, 
again in the first segment of the crossing the goal team. Uh, yeah. if, if you've heard, and, and our viewers obviously have, Danny Abramowitz's story. I mean, raised a Catholic upbringing in Steubenville and went to the NFL and fell away from the church. Well, again, falling away from the church is, is not listening to the rules and, and, and uh, the, the, the structure, the, the, the doctrine, the, the catechism of, uh, that he realized, oh, I have to do all those things to play pro football. I, I have to run the right route. I have to attend the right meetings. I have to understand the defenses. I have to go to film study, but I'm not doing that in my faith. So my faith is withering while my professional, you know, sports ability is, is, is on the rise. And, and he came to a point in his career where he realized, you know, without the faith, none of this means anything. And, and it's, it's uh, th there's analogies where that sports background can, can really help men dial into, oh, I get it. I, I need to apply the discipline. I need to apply the work. I need to put in the effort in order to achieve yeah. uh, with my faith like I've been able to achieve as an athlete. Yeah, you, you mentioned in, in your listing of, of all the rules, one that's fascinating, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot here, but I want you to theologically extrapolate on the importance of running the route. Think about that in a football player and the effect on the team, the outcome, if, if the tackle doesn't run his route. I mean, the, the impact on that, I mean, from your experience, talk about for the audience, for the men out there, how, what that says about our responsibility, not just for us, but for everybody else around us. Right. That, that, well, again, for an offense to work well, everybody has a role. Like you say, the left tackle better be blocking down if it calls for a running play or the right guard needs to be, you know, holding off the defender if it's a pass play and the quarterback has to you know, go through his progression, hit the right receiver, the receivers have to run the proper routes. Well, to me, my faith is the game plan for that. If, if I'm not doing what I need to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis, which is, as we've said, is getting into the Word. Um, mm -hmm. Father Larry Richards at the Catholic Men's Conference last year, boy, I was convicted, Marcus, when he got up there and he said, no Bible before breakfast, no Bible, no Bible, no breakfast, no Bible, no bed. So he says, you've got to get into the Word when you get up. You've got to get in the Word before you go to, to bed. And then he asked the question, he said, uh, so do you pray every day? Ah, well, you know, he says the response he gets from God, ah, I try. You try? Do you try to eat? No, you pray. So I think the sports analogies are great that if you just realize there are certain things I have to do to make this play work. There are certain things I need to do on the job to make this deal work. Well, there's certain things I need to do in my faith, and if I don't do it, it falls apart. And it's getting into the Word, and it's, and again, I, from good Catholic men, just like a player will take advice from a good coach, hey, this guy can help me learn, he can help me improve what I'm doing on the field. Good Catholic men, I know from my perspective, can help me understand what's the game plan, what is it that I need to do so that I can achieve as a, a good father, a, a good yeah. disciple, a good servant uh, to Jesus. Yeah, I remember a movie, an athletic movie, uh, uh, it's too complicated to even describe, but what I do me remember is that the guy was given a chance to be a quarterback, but the men on the line didn't like him. So they weren't run on purposely not running their routes, hmm. not giving him protection. So every time the quarterback got the ball, he was, he was demolished. Right. And to me, that reminds us about our responsibility Christ gives us as a part of the team of the church. It's easy to stand back and criticize those in positions of leadership. But hey, they cannot do their job without our support, without our prayers, without us running the routes that we're supposed to do, without trying to run their routes. No, 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 that's their job. We have our job. And, and this, isn't it interesting as we define what our job is, and again, if we're doing it properly, we're asking God, what, what is our job? We're, we're yeah. Matthew Kelly, another great influence who I've had the pleasure of hearing at the Men's Catholic Conference about spending 10 minutes in the classroom of silence. I love that expression where you ask God, what is your will for me? And then you stop and you listen. Well, you know, th there are nuns whose direction from God is to pray every day for hours. Mm -hmm. And, and I just, as I started to think about, well, what is each one of our, our what, what is our role? God, what do you want from me? If you stop and listen, 
it, it kind of like a football team. Everybody has different roles. Yeah. I mean, I, I may not be able to devote four hours a day to prayer, but that person who does, wow, what a leader yeah. on, on the spiritual team well, that this, person is. This network, EWTN, sure. founded by uh, Mother Angelica and her sisters, who that's their main calling was prayer. Right. I mean, that is the foundation to this network. Besides, the, of course, the prayers and contributions of our supporters, but really Mother Angelica and her, her, her deep commitment to prayer, uh, which, you know, that's what now she is mostly dedicated to. Mm -hmm. I think we have an email here that we can take. Let's see if I can read it. It's a fine print here. Dave from Miami writes, As an avid sports fan, I'm intrigued by the num numerous references I see of players openly expressing their faith. From making the sign of the cross to participating in Bible studies, it seems that many professional athletes are as enthusiastic about Christianity as the sport they play. I don't remember this openness as much in the past. Is this a more recent movement, or was it just not mentioned as much previously? You know, that's a good question, and I would probably attribute it to the fact that media is so expansive now that before it probably wasn't covered as much. I, I would... I would venture to say that there have been, I mean, Johnny Unitas, strong Christian. Right. You, you go back right. through the, the annals of sports, there have been uh, a lot of, uh, you know, Notre Dame and the Catholic football. And, and, and I think that it's probably in the last 20 or 30 years that athletes are, are expressing it more. I mean, I, I think it's wonderful at the end of college football games, you'll see Ohio State and their opponent, they get down and take a knee after the yeah, game and they sure. pray. And I think so people see it more than perhaps they've seen it before, but uh, I've been involved with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes for a long time. Anthony Munoz, who was a uh, mm -hmm. left tackle, all pro, uh, NFL Hall of Famer for the Cincinnati Bengals, helps organize um, youth teams. And my wife, it's funny, we talked about it when she played you know, high school volleyball at Bishop Watterson, and they had a, a strong Fellowship of Christian Athletes organization there. So I think um, those are, are uh, great organizations that, that help uh, our, our student athletes, again, take the basis, which is their faith, which is their church, and then from that, all things grow. Yeah. I was just thinking another great lesson we learned from sports is not only how to take winning, but how to take losing. <laughs> yeah. you know? Well, you, you learn, I, I've read, and there have been studies done on this, that and it, it's not rocket science, we all know it, we don't want to experience it, but it's true. You learn more through failure than you do through success. Yeah. And, and isn't it interesting, again, those life lessons that, that we, we take away when we've had the opportunity to, I mean, I, as, a, as a sports caster and a fan, the last thing I want to see is a football team go into a championship game undefeated, typically, because I like the sting of <laughs> losing uh -huh. so that you can not want that feeling ever again and realize, okay, what have I learned from that? What can we, what can we uh, take away from it and, and move forward? Yeah, I remember the year, a couple years ago, right, in, in Ohio State? Well, they, they defied the odds on that one. They well, didn't lose a game. But, but they almost but. lost every game of the season. <laughs> That's good, you remember yeah. that? I mean, oh, yeah. it was, they, they, they pulled it out with Miami in double sure. overtime. But every single game. Oh, yeah. Purdue on fourth down, Illinois in Cincinnati. overtime. That, exactly. I mean, I, and I think, again, learning – to you know, our, our, our suffering is a part of the Catholic faith, even more than it is in, in the non-Catholic traditions, is that suffering is a necessary part of our journey. Mm -hmm. But it's how we deal with it. Right. And not only is that for our own religious growth, but for those around us, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if a coach takes a, a loss badly with bad language and blaming the refs and all of that, that gives a message to his squad. Right. Well, and my wife, again, my, my uh, Catholic uh, advisor who, who led me to the Catholic Church is, is always reminding me, lift it up to God. Good, bad, right. indifferent, lift it up to God. Right. What, what is your will? Why, why am I experiencing this? What do you want me to learn from this? What is your will for me to move forward from this? Right. Got an email, Michael from Tulsa, Oklahoma. I am very involved in mentoring youth and was wondering if Mr. LaSalle's could give me some suggestion for how to positively share my Catholic faith with these young people who come from all different faith backgrounds. Sure. Well, again, I, I think that once the revelation that, that I, I got from my conversion was that the Catholic faith is the church that 
Jesus Christ founded. And so let me go right to the root. Let me start there uh, again with the, you know, the sports analogies. That's the playbook. Once mm -hmm. I have that playbook, and, and I'm not trying to say that right. the, the writer needs to, to convert every youth that he's counseling to Catholicism right away, but certainly you're starting with the playbook. I mean, if, if you have the wrong playbook, yep. your offense is going to go nowhere. So <laughs> let's start with that and then give them the opportunity, you know, through your discussions to get into the Word, to get, get into their faith, to understand their faith. Again, I, I, I'm a big believer in, in catechism. And, and I'm mm. coming, Marcus, from a standpoint of somebody who wasn't involved with that in, in my youth, and I'm still doing it now at age 53. You know, give them the, the, the right playbook and the instruction and allow them to learn and be there to answer their questions. Uh, you know, that, that's most of it. But, but help them understand that, uh, again, the same discipline that it takes to go out and be successful as an athlete or in school, you need to apply that in your faith life. You, you need to get into the Word. You need to understand what it is that God wants you to do. And, and you get that through the Bible and through, through youth group is, is a wonderful thing to, to have your uh, kids that you, know, you, you want to influence involved in and, and, and hear the Word of God. You and I uh, were both brought up during the 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. 80s. Uh, in many ways, our some of our formation as men, what it means to be a father, what it means to be a husband, uh, came through a difficult time because the 60s, 70s, and 80s, a lot of the attacks were on men, uh, sometimes from the feminists, you know, and, and so sometimes men today come out of that with uh, an insecurity about what, how do I be a good father? How do I be a good husband? And I'm wondering, in your becoming Catholic, how has that helped you be a better father, be a better husband? Well, it, it's helped me understand that by our faith, the doctrine is that we are called upon as the men to be the spiritual leaders in the family. And, and certainly my wife has a big role in that, but it is, it is my responsibility to our children to, to be a, a role model, a, uh, the spiritual leader, the, 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 the leader of the most important area of our life, which is, is our faith. So um, just having the discipline to do that every day, having the understanding that we're, we need to get into the Word. Um, yeah. And again, I, I've gotten a lot of help from my wife who reminds me that, you know, we need to pray in the morning. We need to, I, I know you're busy, you're trying to run a business, we have to, but, but you have to just look at what are the priorities, what's the important thing that we need to do. And, and obviously get your family to Mass every Sunday and, and, uh, and, and direct them in a way that you know is what God wants you to, to do. Yeah, yeah. And I, one thing that I've learned to appreciate in my Catholic faith even more than my evangelical previous background is uh, the important part of humility mm -hmm. to being a good husband and father. I mean, I, I'm still growing on that, you know, in, in terms of recognizing, you know, I, I'm... I have a responsibility as a spiritual leader, but it doesn't mean I'm always perfect. Yeah, right. you, you know, but that's you, you know, and, and we, we talked a little bit about the Catholic Men's Conference. I, I tell you, Marcus, I was asked to MC that seven years ago. I had never attended before. It wasn't that I was averse to it; it just wasn't on my radar. I tell men that that, that is the most enjoyable, inspirational, mm -hmm. motivational day of my year because the messages that we're talking about, you get. I mean, we've had great speakers. You spoke there, mm -hmm. um, Matthew Kelly. Um, Robert Rogers last year who lost right. his entire family in a flash flood and it's funny that th just the message that you just mentioned he Robert Rogers was talking about how his faith sustained him through that terrible tragedy mm -hmm. he knows his wife and four kids are in heaven but he talked about what it takes to sustain a relationship now and what you need to do in terms of showing the respect to your wife and I'm one of these I guess it's my sports casting background I'm, I'm, I'm more orally oriented than than written and I just take <laughs> copious notes from these speakers, and that was one of the, the areas that, that he touched on. And, and I, I encourage men to be around men who, again, you know, the, the, the seven um, secrets to success, this book, what does it tell you to do? Follow people who have been successful. What do coaches yeah. do? They emulate successful coaches. You as a Catholic man, if you want to be a better Catholic man, what do these Catholic, great Catholic men do? You know, what, what, what is it that Patrick Madrid says about getting into the, the catechism? 
which again I'm, I'm, I'm doing now with this Father Karapi series, which is which is awesome. What is it that um, Father Larry Richards, who says, you know, no Bible, no breakfast, no Bible, no bed? Well, that's convicting. That that's the yeah. answer. That's how I find out, you know, well, that's why what the it church is, God is wants always to put do. in front of us saints. The saints of the church yeah. has always put those in front of us, so that from an early age we learn them, we understand why they're saints and the sacrifices they make. And how by grace God led them to be a deeper uh, union with Him. We've got another email. This comes from Brent, Rhode Island. I've never had much faith in God, but lately have been feeling a tugging for something more. How do I build a relationship with God? Well, that's great. It starts with prayer. I mean, it, it is just to get on your knees every night, morning. And, and uh, again, I, I tend to quote, like coaches quote their influences. I quote great Catholic men. Matthew Kelly is one of my favorite, who said, spend 10 minutes a day in the classroom of silence. And, and again, that means, God, what, what do you want from me? What is your will for me? And be willing to listen. So uh, it starts with your prayer life. Yeah. Uh, I would say it, it, it also includes, obviously, getting into the scripture. It, it, it's going to mass. It's going to mass, if you can, on a daily basis a weekly basis, join a men's group. A men's group is just, uh, or if you're a, a woman, join a women's group. I mean, we have different issues, men and, and women, obviously. And, you know, a men's group is not only an opportunity for you to learn more about the faith, but to have an accountability partner, to have men who are who can truly, I mean, my I'm 53. My men's group has a lot of guys who are in their 70s. And, and it's great for me because I'm around guys who have been, in the faith for 30, 40 years, who, who uh, again, I'm always writing down notes. That's a great thing to do. I, I, so so it, it's all of that. It, it's just getting going to the source of your faith, which is it starts in prayer, but it includes every opportunity to expose yourself to, to those influences that will help you get closer to God. One thing I want to add into that email, because he said he was feeling a tugging, and... Uh, it seems to me that in prayer, one of the first things he needs to do, which we both need to do, I think, is begin by being thankful to God. I mean, this sure. thankfulness and recognizing, just the fact that he's, he's recognizing a tugging. Well, where's it coming from? That's God. That's God himself in his grace and his love. And so we begin by our thankfulness, recognizing that that tugging wasn't me all of a sudden getting intelligent. It was God reaching out to you just in your own life. I mean, this guy that brought you a Bible, that wasn't an accident. Right, right. Well, and, and if you go to your church and, and we go to uh, Adoration at St. Andrew, I'm a parishioner in, in Upper Arlington, and there's, there are little booklets on how to pray. And again, it starts with being thankful to God. It starts with worshiping God. It starts with um, being reverent to God and and. All those little, I, I mean, yeah. I'm not that smart, Marcus. The more <laughs> direction I have that helps me to do what it is that, that I need to do to get closer to God, I'm going to take all that advice. Yeah. Again, yeah. I get tired of the sports analogies, but if I, if I think this is the great way to run a particular route as a wide receiver and I get crushed every player, I'm missing the ball. You know, this coach over here standing on the sideline who's been around football longer than I've been alive who says, well, no, you really want to do a head fake to the left and go right. And I do that and I catch the ball. I'm going to do that. So so all the, the material that's out there that's in the church, I mean, stop into your your your, your local uh, church, your, your, your Catholic church, and pick up the, the, the little booklets on how to pray uh, and follow all that got a minute to go real quick. Let's say that somebody's out there watching right now that's where you were, whether it's Unitarian, nothing, or maybe he's made mistakes, though he loves Christ. Why would they, why should they come home to the Catholic Church? Because it is the, the rock, it's the foundation, it's the basis from which everything else follows. You need a foundation of the proper way to build your faith, just like you need a foundation and the proper way to bake a cake, play a football game, become a corporate executive. And to me, it, it helped me to eliminate a lot of the other options that were fluff, that, that didn't head me in the right direction. So my encouragement would be, why would you not go? I mean, if, if the guy who invented the engine says, this is how you fix the engine, I'm going to go there. 
And if the man who started the, the Catholic Church, his church, Jesus Christ, if I can go and, and, and talk to him as close as I can, obviously, through prayer and through understanding the church and understanding how he built that engine known as our faith, that's where I'm going to start. All right. Doug, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. One of these men's conferences here in Columbus. Thanks so much for your work and your continued work on radio with the Catholic broadcasting you do for St. Gabe. It's fun. I'm enjoying it. It's a blessing. Okay. Uh, Thank you for joining us on this program. I hope that his story was an encouragement to you. Uh, It helps us see all the different ways God touches our lives and draws us back home to him. So God bless you. See you next week. 